So he did this undergraduate at Harvard.
So where is the where is the dust emission in the galaxy? So this is a map of the total dust column density by this is the uh, so-called SFD dust map evaluated using a dust model at 94 gigahertz by FDS permutation. Um, and so here you see that same dusty region as you see in the W map map. Okay. So the, the dust emission in our galaxy is well traced, they say, by a map at 100 microns. Uh, free free goes something like frequency to the minus 2.15. So as you go up the frequency, it falls. It becomes less important. And you can see the features pop out in a map of H alpha. So this is a map of H alpha that was assembled by uh, F, the big planet, um, uh, several, years, several years ago, more than a year now. And uh, you can see these clouds in H alpha that are essentially emitting free free emission. The idea here is that the same electrons and protons which uh, scatter off each other make free free emission combine and make H alpha recombination line emission. And there's a scaling of the temperature. And lastly, synchrotron. So synchrotron is a little bit tricky because it goes, it's something like a power law. In fact, it turns out that over most of the sky, it's roughly minus three. And you can go down to 408 megahertz because it's because it's falling with frequency at lower frequencies it's relatively more important. So you go down past WMAP's frequency range to a lower frequencies and it becomes the dominant emission mechanism. And you can see this big loop one supernova remnant. You can also see emission from the disk. This is the radio survey from Haslam et al. 1982. Um, if anybody wants to do a radio survey at higher resolution, that would be fantastic. Yes. What extent can we begin to filter foregrounds? I mean, you're doing your foregrounds based on time dependency. Yeah, all of these things are rather long time scale. So they're shorter time scale than, for example, changes in the CMB is a bunch of the time. Sure. But uh, yeah, yeah not, not within our lifetime. And in fact, it's, yeah, so there's, there's more dependence. This is going to get a little technical. There's more dependence on the morphology based on the energy dependence electrons making the synchrotron, for example, than there is in how much it will change over the course of our lifetime. All right, so, so these are the basic emission mechanisms that, that are work in our galaxy of juggling map wavelengths. So given that each of these emission mechanisms is basically traced by maps at other frequencies, we can essentially perform the exercise of saying, okay, the data equals some linear combination of these three template maps. This is called template fitting. It's one of the most basic, uh, simple ways you yeah, actually solve the equation for regression. So D is the data, P is a matrix of template maps, A is the amplitudes of each of these templates, N is the noise. This is just a solution to uh, this is just a solution to a linear equation. Um, but this is the most basic way to separate foregrounds. So we do that. We actually do it over a region outside of the galactic plane. Because, the, uh, because as you go down towards the plane, this fundamental idea breaks down. The emission mechanisms uh, are, are, no longer, are no longer simple. They're not optically thin. They're not simple linear combinations of each other. All right, so let's do that piece by piece, which is what we did a long time ago. So first, let's talk about free-free. So keep your eye on these two part free-free blobs. And we essentially subtract off the appropriate amount of the H alpha template, and you see that those start to go away. Very good. Um, now we do the same thing with the dust emission. And you see these dust clouds here and here, and also down here. And as you, uh, as you, as you subtract off the dust correlated emission, most of that goes away, um, except for this disk in here that's a synchrotron disk in the loop that's up top. And then finally, you do that with the synchrotron template. And you see that that mostly goes away. Uh, the one exception is this brightish blob towards the galactic center. So this is what is called the microwave haze. And this is, uh, this is essentially a full sky fit. So we fit all of the pixels that are not masked on this map. Um, a better thing to do is to break the sky up into smaller regions, because we know that the power law for synchrotron, for example, varies a bit. That power law for synchrotron is directly relatable to the power law of the electron population. So number is a function of energy. Um, and so the, the power law for synchrotron, that new to the minus three, is actually a measure of the electron spectrum. And that's known to vary 
uh, throughout the galaxy. Um, things also get complicated up here as the gas temperature is changing, especially up here. So we broke this guy up into regions, and I'll stretch it a bit harder, and this is what it looks like. So this elongated blob here is what we call the, the microwave haze. But what is it, okay? So we'll get to that. But this has several unique properties that separate it from other foregrounds. First of all, uh, it's diffuse and extended. That in itself is not shocking. But this is actually a very large distance. So that loop that I showed you was nearby. This is at the galactic center, and this is minus 35 or so degrees. The north is very complicated. You can tell from the previous map, because I had so many things circled, the north is very complicated. The south is relatively clean. Um, so this is like minus 35 degrees. And given that we're eight and a half kiloparsecs away from the galactic center, the volume of this emitting region is five kiloparsecs by 12 kiloparsecs, really big. Uh, another very interesting feature of the haze is its spectrum. So I told you that uh, synchrotron was frequency to the minus three, three free was frequency to the minus two, point one five, and dust has a spectrum that goes up with frequency. So for the spectrum, we concentrate on the south, again, because the north is so complicated. So we essentially look, we're looking in this region just to, to see what the spectrum condition is. And here's a plot that comes up kind of OK that we made a while ago. So this is the total synchrotron, so the haze plus that other, plus the other H out, the plasma template. And the, the intensity is the intensity of the emission, and the color is essentially the spectral index. So you can see up here, it's, it's, it's redder and pinker. It's more like minus 3. And when you look at just the haze emission, it's kind of hard to see, but it's more like minus 2.5. If you just make a plot of the uh, emission as a function of frequency, for the haze region, you get these three data points. This is the minus 2.5 power law. And this is for the total synchrotron. So the haze is synchrotron emission with a very hard spectrum compared to elsewhere in the galaxy. And it needs a very hard electron spectrum, something like e to the minus 2. Now, why is e to the minus 2 so shocking? Uh, it's shocking because of this fact right here. e to the minus 2 is essentially what you get from shock acceleration and supernova remnants, right? So this is as hard as it's going to get, um, either, either through what's called second order Fermi acceleration, which is acceleration by turbulence in the uh, shocks, or just even first order Fermi acceleration where the shock is compressing the electrons and bouncing back and forth. You always get out near the minus two. But by the time you've diffused over this very large region, your electrons lose energy and soften the spectrum and in fact, if you just do the calculation and say, what is that spectrum in a box, it should be e to the minus 3, which is what we see everywhere else, except for here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this part. This is uh, essentially a more complicated foreground model, but we'll just stick to that for now. OK, so now moving on to part 2. Well, this yeah. is a question. So uh, I'm not sure you really convinced us that this is this is a power of law based on these three points. Uh, yeah, so WMAP has essentially uh, a broadband centered around roughly around 23, 33, 41. Planck, uh, studies are ongoing with Planck, but there will be more groups in there. Okay, we'll fill in some of these holes. Yes, if the haze exists in Planck, yes. then its frequency bands are more like here. Here. Now, generically, of course, you don't expect power law behavior. People who work on component separation in CMB uh, often consider power law behavior for synchrotron. But of course, in general, you might you would expect something more like this. That the way the reason this happens is synchrotron emission, the electrons lose energy as E squared, so their energy squared. So the higher energy electrons lose their energy faster than the lower energy electrons. So if you have a power law injection in the N to E, then these higher energy guys lose their energy faster and get dumped down here. So the whole thing starts to tilt. So, but not only does it tilt, it develops curvature. Right? So you, at some point, you expect a break. And so the power law assumption probably breaks down. Kind of amazing that this is as close to a power law as it actually is. Discuss the independent evidence against this basin, which is a very weird dust. 
Ah, so weird dust, the, the possibilities for weird dust are the following. So we don't see thermal emission from the sky. So there is no, as, as you go up in frequency, it does not go up like this. So in order for it to be dust somehow, for it to be falling, uh, you'd have to have some kind of spinning dust model that then has no large grains to make thermal emission. Uh, seems difficult. What, the, what, what are actually the strengths and the grain size that you would pass in this uh, high frequency? Uh, uh, I don't have the number of the grain size on the top of my head, but spinning dust usually comes from grains that are on the order of 100 atoms big. Right? And so. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost certainly not spinning dust. Uh, and I have I have corroborating evidence that it is synchrotron. Which we're going to discuss in a minute. Okay. So part two came right as I was leaving uh, the CFA. The week before I left the CFA, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope released their first year data. And um, up until the very day I was leaving, we were taking that data, which comes in the form of photons as a function of position, right? Because in gamma astronomy, you get photons. And we were making maps. Um, one of the reasons of which was because if you have a big blob of emitting synchrotron radiation, the electrons that are making the synchrotron should inverse Compton scatter uh, photons. CMB photons, starlight photons, infrared photons. Um, up to Fermi energies, and you should be able to see something in Fermi just based on the microwaves if it's synchrotron. Okay, so we made the maps, and then I drove to Santa Barbara, and a week later, um, we really sat down and, and dug it out and got the got the paper out. But this is essentially what we found. So this is the this is a full sky map of Fermi photons um, smoothed to. Uh, roughly the full width half maximum and lower energies. Um, there's some gamma ray, uh, there's some details that went into this map that I won't get into. Uh, but this is, uh, these are photons between 2 and 5 GeV at Fermi, uh, observed by Fermi. So you see the galaxy. In fact, this looks a lot like the dust map, if you compare it. The reason being that the dominant source of these photons that you're seeing here comes from cosmic ray protons that are hitting the interstellar medium, making pi zero particles that decay to give you gamma rays. That's the dominant source of emission uh, from the galaxy. And then there's also, uh, there's also Bremsstrom, just like there was in microwaves. There's also, the tail extends up to gamma rays, there's also Bremsstrom. Uh, there's also inverse Compton scattering from electrons that are just accelerated by supernovae. So the non-haze stuff that I showed you uh, in the the previous slides. So but maybe you can already start to see something. We did. As you were, as you're staring at these things, you say, okay, maybe there's something there. It's a little bit more prominent on my screen, but that's okay. But now let's say it seems that it's pretty bright. It may even be the brightest thing at high latitudes. Low latitudes definitely not. So let's just put a big mass on it. And now it pops up here as well. Okay, so there is definitely something happening, especially in the south. Again, the north is complicated because of all of the ISM, it makes a lot of pi zeros. So let's just look at the south for a minute. So there's definitely something here. And you can see that even with no templates, no fitting, no subtraction, etc., no getting rid of the galaxy at all. Just put a huge mask on the galaxy, look at high latitudes, and you see something um, centered roughly on the north. Okay, what is that? Still not going to get there yet, but let me keep going. So I just explained to you the different emissions that are coming into this map. Now I've stretched this slightly harder so that the galaxy looks a bit brighter. So this is the, the essentially energy dependence of each of those emission mechanisms. The intensity is a function of energy. So that process I described that makes pi zero particles and decays, the spectrum goes something like this and it dominates in regions as you get down towards the galactic plane. Inverse Compton has a spectrum roughly like this. 
It depends a little bit, uh, it depends obviously on the spectrum of the electrons and also the spectrum of the interstellar radiation field that is being scattered. And Bremsstrahlung looks something like this, falls away. So you can take a model for the galaxy. This is the so-called Fermi diffuse model, which, which attempts to match all of those emission mechanisms to what is seen in, in the sky. And you subtract the model from the data, and this is what we found. So there's this big, bright, tall thing that, shaped, that seems to be shaped roughly like an hourglass um, towards the galactic center in the Fermi data. So this is, we called it the, this is the image that was in the paper. So uh, we called it the Fermi haze at the time because it was the inverse Compton counterpart of the synchrotron haze. So the same electrons that are making synchrotron are making gamma rays. So this, uh, if you look closely, you see that this has kind of sharpish edges. And so this was renamed the Fermi bubbles, so that was generically called the Fermi huge bubbles. Okay. So now, this looks very nice. This is very uh, suggestive of many different things. There was, there's a small wrinkle here uh, that I'll talk about. So this is the exact same map, 25 GeV. But now what if, we, what if we do something different? What if, rather than modeling the galaxy, modeling the galaxy causes some problems, uh, primarily because we're looking at the integrated map. Right? Whereas the galaxy is three-dimensional, and so if you're going to make pi zero particles that decay to gammas, that depends on where the protons are, and it also depends on where the interstellar medium is. Right? So if you use an estimate for what the interstellar medium is, like the column density along the line of sight, you're essentially integrating along the line of sight, then you're missing some of that three-dimensionality because you can have your ISM here, your protons here, and you don't get much pi zeros, but you could get a lot of ISM. Okay? So another thing you can do, you can say, what's the spectrum down here where it's pretty clean? And we get a spectrum that looks something like this. It's much harder than the spectrum elsewhere in the galaxy. Again, it's a lot like the synchrotron emission. So you can take a map at half a GeV and use that to trace the galaxy at higher energy, because as you go up in energy, this component becomes more important because it has a harder spectrum, right? This automatically takes into account 3D effects and things like that. So comparing data to data, you essentially subtract one from the other and you get this, which looks very similar with the exception that it doesn't really pinch in in the center, maybe it looks a little bit brighter in the center, it looks a little bit more like an oval and a little bit less like an hour. Uh, so this one is essentially comparing model to data, and this one is data to data. All this is is a statement that emission in this geometry has a harder spectrum than elsewhere in the galaxy. So what is this? Obviously lots and lots of uh, different ideas popped up. Um, this is just a visual illustration of how those line of sight effects work. Uh, so for example, this is the data, and I use column density as a tracer of pi zero emission, and as you increase numbers themselves specifically don't matter, as you increase the, uh, the amount of column density you're subtracting, you start to carve out this x towards the galactic center, the reason being that the pi zero to dust ratio changes in that shape. So you could have something that looks like a mobile, but then carve out an x and a bit more of an hour class. As you go down towards the galaxy, it gets pretty hairy. High latitudes, though, pretty solid. Uh, so what is it? There have been lots of ideas that came out. Uh, there was a NASA press release on this, which opens a whole, uh, a whole different class of uh, comments from folks. But it, uh, there were a lot of ideas, some of them well motivated, some of them less well motivated. Um, when we just had the microwaves, things sort of faded away diffusely in dark matter annihilation, in which the dark matter is composed of uh, particles that are thermal relics from the Big Bang. Uh, self-annihilate in the galactic halo, making electron-positron pairs, which then make synchrotron. Uh, that actually looked pretty good. It doesn't produce sharp edges, though, so maybe not so good. Um, I'll go through a whole list in a second. But before I start going through the laundry list of ideas that I think are well-motivated, and some of the problems that they all have, none of them do a very good job, um, let's talk about some of the features that make this such a difficult problem. 
So I already said that the edges appear sharp. Uh, here is a description of that in this paper from uh, Meng Su and Doug uh, and Rick Banner and Tracy Slatcher. So this is essentially uh, if annuli away from the center of the emission. So, so if you're here, say, and you take an annulus as a function of radius from the center of this bubble, you say what is the what is the brightness as a function of energy, as a function of position, radius. Uh, it looks like this. So it looks reasonably flat out to when you get to the edge, and it, and it falls off. So that's very difficult uh, for a reason I'll, I'll get to in a second. And it also seems to have this flat spectrum over a very large energy range here. This is detected out to 50-ish GeV. And to get out past 100, uh, there are very few photons uh, past 100. And so you start to become limited. But out to 50 GeV, you have a pretty flat spectrum, uh, which is kind of amazing uh, given that we're detecting this at 10 kiloparsecs off the plane. So this first part seems to apply a very contrived electron distribution. If you have a emitting region that is essentially emitting gamma rays uniformly, then it's going to get limb darkened, right? If you have a region that is only emitting gamma rays on, on the shell, then it's going to be limb bright. Neither of those things we see in the data. We see it roughly flat in gamma rays. So this requires some kind of contrived electron distribution where you slowly get more electrons towards the shell. Um, but it's very coincidental. And this flat spectrum, especially with emission up here at 100 GeV, and even the order 2 to 5 GeV photons, a 10 kiloparsec off the plane. So to make a 2 to 5 GeV gamma ray, you need an electron that is a TeV, okay? From if you're inverse confidence scattering the CMB. So you need TeV electrons 10 kiloparsecs off the plane. Tricky. So these are essentially the the ideas that were put out there, um, these are the sort of, there were there a few more, but these are the ones that seem to have the most sort of oomph to them. The first was uh, a wind model by uh, Roland Crocker and Felix Ahlund. So in this scenario, there's some kind of uh, outflow towards the galactic center that's been going on for a very long time. And in fact, the gamma rays are made uh, by protons hitting some, some slightly underdense medium that then produces pi zeros. It doesn't really explain the synchrotron. It, it, it makes them by secondary, so there's some magnetic field tension. Um, but there's two main problems with this. Um, well, first of all, the time scales for this to happen are on the order of billions of years. So in order to get the wind up to the heights that we see and get the spectrum that we see, this has to be happening for billions of years. And if something is happening for billions of years, this probably violates one. It's probably not going to have a shot there. And there's an additional constraint, which is the fact that we don't see this in H alpha. If you're pumping material out of the galaxy for a billion years, you're going to have a lot of cool gas around. And we don't see this feature in H alpha. That cool gas should be moving right in H alpha. The other idea was the starburst. Um, this has numerous problems. Um, but again, the H alpha, this is again something that's happening on a very long time scale, but again, uh, violates H alpha. Right? If you see this, winds and starbursts in other galaxies, for example, this is M82, has these big bright H alpha filaments and big bright H alpha blobs that we just don't see in our galaxy. Okay? Next one's pretty promising, which is some kind of accretion event that drives a jet and blows a bubble. This also has problems, but it's you know, it has the advantage that we know that it happens in other galaxies. Uh, it has the disadvantage that uh, it's difficult to see how you're going to get a flat profile out of this sharp edge. Sure, you have a shock. Um, the initial simulations done by uh, Fulai, Guo, and Bill Matthews um, had instabilities at the edge, which we don't see in the data. I'll get, more, get to that more in a second. And there's also this curious thing where, you know, we see radio lobes in other galaxies. But we don't see radio lobes here. The, the emission in the microwaves is confined towards the center of the galaxy, not high latitudes. There's this, uh, but I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. 
There's this second order Fermi acceleration idea, which isn't really a way of making it, it just how to accelerate the electron, which is that they're being accelerated in the, in the shell. Uh, this violates synchrotron, but I'll get more back to that in a second. Uh, the synchrotron is in the middle of that. And then there was the old dark matter idea, which violates one, uh, in that it does, it does not produce uh, sharp edges plus a flat profile. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk about these two uh, a bit more for, for a few seconds. Okay. So this is the, these are the two maps that I showed you before. This is the haze slash bubbles at 2 to 5 GeV. And this is the haze slash bubbles at 2 to 5 GeV using different prescriptions for removing galactic emissions. So in one panel, in one column, I'll show the AGN uh, jet blown bubble idea that we worked on. And in the other one, I'll show the dark matter and H model that we worked on. So these essentially are the equations that you solve in each case. In the one case, you have this, uh, you have this uh, two fluid system where you're shooting an underdense jet into the interstellar medium. So this is a paper that we wrote with Fulai and Bill and Pan Oak. Um, and you, the, the addition here was this viscous term, which has, the, which has the, the important effect of suppressing the instabilities, which was one of the main problems in the initial model generated stabilities at the edge, whereas you've seen at the edge. Okay. Uh, in, in the other model, you're essentially solving a steady state diffusion equation. Again, this doesn't produce the edges. And we included an isotropic diffusion effect. So essentially, if there's a, an ordered field component towards the center of the galaxy, then the electrons can stream uh, along that more easily. And then you have uh, some ejection. You solve the ejection from the dark halo, and you solve the diffusion equation. So this is what you get out in each case. So this is the map of the dark matter model. So here you see we've suppressed some of There's still a little bit of wiggliness, but the original simulations had large eddies, of course. And so you see this jet, and you see this bubble forming here. So this is a two-dimensional slice. These simulations were in 2D. And so from this two-dimensional slice, uh, it's essentially one quadrant slice. So you flip it. Uh, flip it, spin it around Nazareth, integrate along the line of sights. Can, can you go back to the question? Sure. Um, so, uh, kappa is diffusion and um, using what formula for it? Uh, so this is just isotropic diffusion with uh, fixed diffusion constant. Um, and uh, so it's essentially a completely tangled, essentially a completely tangled magnetic field inside. Of the but and, there's, uh, this is not an HD. And pi is uh, stress, so but pi uh, is yes. so you've got a nu as well. Uh, yeah. So there's so there's yes. There's so the physics of the kappa and the nu are based upon the gas. Yes. You go to space and you get your number exactly. So there's nothing fancy about it. No, no, there's nothing fancy. No turbulent viscosity or anything like that. Mm -hmm. okay. In fact, the value for mu that we take for the viscosity term is a percent to sub percent of Spitzer. Yeah, I have a that. Well, that's, that's essentially all you need to stop these. Uh, so you were just stuff. interested in yeah. having a far enough exactly. stuff. Yeah, when Fulai first came to me with the simulations and said, look, I said, we don't see these big Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities at the edge. Right? So, so he and I talked about using viscosity. And, um, and so the degrees of freedom and the dark matter annihilation propagation depend upon the uh, an anisotropic uh, uh, diffusion coefficient. Uh, Tensor, essentially. Yeah, and uh, the omega i here is? Uh, the omega i is the cyclotron frequency. Okay. Is that an obvious thing that that's the way um, that should go? It's not obvious to me, but it's Yeah, it's, 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 it's not. So, so this is essentially the cyclotron frequency, and this new here is the frequency of being scattered by one radian, essentially. So the whole thing depends on the ratio of those two. And so this is? 
universally decided upon this Yeah, so there was a lot of work done on charged particles traveling in turbulent plus uniform fields and interplanetary systems. And, and uh, the momentum is entering through the olecran? The momentum of the particle yeah. uh, so is in this term. So diffusion does not depend upon momentum. There's no diffusion momentum space here. Uh, nor that, you know, the particles will hot. Psi is how many variables in it then? Ah, it's uh, space and energy. And energy. Right? So no, it does depend on energy. The yeah. energy loss term depends on energy, so the higher energy. But D doesn't depend on energy. No, the is that obvious why it doesn't? Uh, is that obvious why it doesn't? So I would have expected I could go farther if I was at a higher energy. You can, but the only reason is because no, you can't go farther to the higher energy because you lose your energy more quickly. It's actually dominated by this energy loss term, which goes at e squared. Well, once the energy gets high enough, you can break out. This is the particles that you are. Directly probing the of these channels, the gyrates is tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny compared to the size of the bubble. So. But this also does depend on the gyrates. So there is some physics in here. Ah, okay. So it's actually depends upon it at some level. Yeah, that, that's right. So usually the, the, the baseline model that everybody used before we added this was that. D zero, which is which is not right from just you can you can start writing out what you think the diffusion should be, and it should already depend on the magnetic field. So assuming a completely uniform magnet uh, diffusion constant given some magnetic field is just wrong from the beginning. But that's what's usually assumed. So but this D zero depends on the magnetic field amplitude of the turbulent field, and then this part captures the orientation of the ordered part. And so if you were uh, just doing a map of D, yeah. what would it look like? So as you are, as you get down towards the plane, yeah. uh, the diffusion goes down, and you're tied more to the magnetic field. And as you go off the plane, the ordered part kicks in, and you start to freeze through. So your diffusion length goes up as you go away from the plane. So this makes some assumption for the conflict. Yeah, so the magnetic field was constructed specifically to not violate any observations. And you are, in all assumed that the particles are accelerated in some central engine and they diffuse out. That's right. They not be continuously re accelerated. That's right, there's no re acceleration. All right, so when you so this is a map of the essentially energy density of the particles. So one of the one sticking point that we still have to work out is we're not actually accelerating. We don't actually cool cosmic rays, right? We take into account energy losses and gains, but we don't inject cosmic rays and do cooling in these simulations. That's still to be worked out. But if you just take the energy density and integrate along the line of sight. What did we see there? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. So the colors are just a rainbow stretch of the total energy density. Uh, this is the position in kiloparsecs, and the arrows are the direction of velocity of the fluid on So you have some initial, uh, you have some initial jet which starts off down here, it shoots up, it starts to form a bubble, right? And the whole, there's a shock wave propagating outwards, and this is the end result of what it is. Uh, so there's no change in gravity. There's a gravitational well, obviously, due to the galaxy, and it has multiple components in it. So this Bulge, is this, yellow. Um, but the energy, the energy density of the cosmic rays changes as much as time. That's what's essentially being calculated. Right. And so it's, this is stopped when the height of this equals the projected height of 15 degrees. So I'm going to go to a random big AGN somewhere way up there. Yeah. 
So what this essentially is, is, is a map of where the integrated cosmic ray density is. So you have the NDB. This is essentially the square of the NDB. Okay. And yeah, so this is, this is essentially the sky map that you would see. It's still not completely uniform. So the, the diffusion was turned on in here and out, out here. Okay. So that's an important point because you see a sharp edge. Okay? You don't want diffusion outside the bubble. Something is confining the cosmic rays. I'll get more, I'll get back to that in a second. But something is confining the cosmic rays. Probably draping. Probably magnetic draping. Um, but we're not there yet. So if we just take this model, this model on the right, and subtract it from the respective data, these are the sorts of residuals that we get. Does a pretty good job in the dark matter case. Doesn't have the sharp edges, so you do see some residual in the ring. Uh, this AGM model does not do well towards the center, basically because it has a stem, right? And then you're integrating through less volume as you go down towards the plane. So you don't really see much down here, whereas we do see stuff in data. But in general, it doesn't look too bad. So for reference, this is that's just the top panel, so this is what was removed by the model. Okay. So the time scale the, <coughs> the AGN models recently there. That's right. So there's a couple constraints on this. It's a little bit tricky, but there's a couple constraints. It has to be about a mega year ago. The if it's much longer than that, then the cooling of your cosmic rays will make it too soft to make high energy damage Uh if it's much shorter than that, then your jet has to be moving too fast to get the 10 kilopunches. The bubble has to be essentially rising too fast. So it's about a mega year ago, which, uh, which is possible. I mean, our, our central black hole is not very active right now. Maybe a year ago, maybe a bit more so. It's a little bit confusing because there's these, as we heard a couple of days ago, there's these stellar uh, disk that's towards the center of the galaxy that I naively would have thought would be disrupted by a massive event. That disk seems to be five or so million years old. Um, and so if there was an event about a million years ago, I would have thought that would have disrupted the disk somehow. But that's uh, maybe circumstantial. But yes, this was about a million years ago. OK. So there are lots of puzzles, some of which will hopefully get solved in the near future. So this one is, per, I'll, I'll basically go through three of the things that I think are most curious and most interesting from a physics perspective. So one of them is, how are cosmic rays accelerated in jets? So if they're accelerated in the jet itself as it's coming out, then a mega year is much longer than the cooling time of a TeV electron. A TeV electron loses all its energy in about 500,000 years, between 500,000 and 600,000 years. So if your jet happened to make a year ago, why do we see uh, all of these uh, gamma rays, these inverse Compton gamma rays at 10 kiloparsecs, your electron would have cooled by the time it got up there and would not make what we see? The other alternative is that the cosmic rays are being accelerated in the shock front and then diffusing into the bubble itself. Uh, again, there's this issue of limb brightening. I'll get back to that in a second. But there's a bigger question of, if you're being accelerated in the shock front, then where are the microwaves? So let me show you this picture. So going back to the microwaves from before, um, if, you were to, if you were to take the brightness of the microwaves as a function of distance down from the galactic center, you see something like this. So it's roughly flat and then it falls off. Okay, But now the microwaves seem to fall off around 30 degrees, whereas the gamma rays fall off, as I showed you in the uh, two slides ago, 50 degrees. 
Okay, so this is just the gamma rays, 2 to 5 GeV, and this is the microwaves. Again, let's concentrate on the top. The microwaves at WFK band. So if we zoom in on the bottom, this is the microwaves, and this orange circle is roughly the outer boundary of the gamma rays. So while they're very co-located in here, as you get out here, the microwaves die off faster than they're still gamma rays. So if the electrons are being accelerated out here, where are the microwaves in here? So uh, you must have said this already. Uh, what, what distance are we dealing with there? This is about 5, 6 kiloparsecs, and this is 10 kiloparsecs. Okay. Incidentally, this also suggests, since we know the electrons are there, regardless of how they're accelerated, if the synchrotron is dominated by the magnetic field within the jet and within the bubble itself. Fuzzy today, uh, what is the radius of the, the, the scale of the molecular weight? That is a couple of, uh, you mean in height? Like, as you look above and below the plane? Yeah, um, well, I want to see, can you see any of the molecular weight? Ah, uh, no. There's no indication in any of these channels of the uh, In the gamma rays, in the gamma rays, uh, it's very hard to tell because you're integrating along the line of sight, so it's hard to know where your gamma rays are coming from. But sort of the best, fit, when, you, when you fit out a model using cosmic ray propagation codes, for example, the best fits come from including the molecular ring in generating high zero to high zero values. You need to include that information to get the right shape. That's true. But those, that's a, there's a much lower latitude. So this is, this is essentially a statement of what I said before, is when we see AGNs in other galaxies, we see radio lobes. And we see no radio lobes here. Microwaves are fine, more or less the same. So we see a sharp edge, but it's frequency different. Uh, this, is, these are, this is all the same frequency. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, well, energy dependent in terms of the part of the emitting part. So if, if I have, a, say, a microdose magnetic oh, field, I see what you're saying. Yeah. microdose magnetic field out there, what is the energy of the microwave emitting particles compared? I mean, you sort of know what the energy of the right. GD emitting particles is because it's just CMB. So, yeah, yeah, out here, if this is a few microgauss magnetic field, these are 10 GD electrons. And these are coming from T, and these are coming from TED electrons. The TED electrons are more extended than these 10 GD electrons. Yes. But as you get to the plane, uh, essentially, yes. Um, so, no. <laughs> emission from 10 GeV electrons is more extended, is less extended than emission from TeV electrons. So we know that there are, we know that there are particles out here, but don't confuse the magnetic field with the electrons. Right? So the magnetic field could drop very quickly. In fact, I suspect that's exactly what happened. Is that the magnetic field is dropping by something within the bubble? We don't we don't see a similar drop when you look in the radio at the galactic plane. So it's probably not the whole galactic magnetic field dropping very quickly. It's probably the magnetic field within the bubble that drops right here. So. so that does bring up the question of the complexity of the magnetic field <clears throat> and uh, the impact of that on the ability to actually make a forecast. So that's that's surely right. that's got a big influence on yeah. anything that you're trying to draw from this model. So we need to do we need to do two things. We need to do an MHD and we need to do a southern copy phrase. Well, but when you say do MHD, but that doesn't mean that we're yeah. going to get a handle on that's that. That's right. I, 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 I don't disagree. The magnetic yes. field is yes. in that. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll show you in a second. Well, okay. we'll that um, right. So then there's that limb brightening aspect I talked about before, where if you are accelerating in the shock, let's forget about the microwaves for a second. Um, you should see limb brightening as you go up in energy, right? The diffusion length, because electrons lose energy as e squared the lower energy electrons have gone farther than the higher energy electrons, right? So the higher energy electrons, it is said, trace the morphology of the injection. 
more closely than the lower energy level. Okay? So the higher the energy you go, the more your emission should look like where the electrons are being injected. Uh, so you should see limb breaking at higher energies and not at lower energies as the electrons are being in. We do not see that in the data. Maybe with 10 more years of Fermi or the Cherenkov telescope array, you might be able to see this. Especially CTA uh, goes up to, has much better sensitivity than Fermi at energies above about 200 degrees. So, in terms of where the cosmic rays are being accelerated in jets, this may be something that we can get a handle on within the next few years. Okay, why is the brightness profile so flat? This is related to the uh, previous one, but again, generically, your two simplest thoughts would be that you either have something that's a big ball of something emitting uniformly, but that would produce limb darkening, which we don't see, or it's going to be uh, the shell that's, that's accelerating the electrons, which produces limb brightening, which we also don't see. So neither of those fit the data very well. And as such, why is the stem so bright, right? Any, any sort of, I have, there are a couple ideas why this might be, but uh, anything where you sort of have a, a stem coming out, you're going to be looking through less of it as you go down in latitude. So it's going to, your projected emission should get darker. That doesn't seem to be the case here. Right? And so the last one is, is exactly what we were just talking about. So. These two and the emission, as Dick just pointed out, are intimately related. But what is the nature of this magnetic field within sort of jet flow and bubbles? Right? So we don't really see a polarized signal with W map. Let me show you why you would not necessarily expect that anyway. So this is W map polarization at K band. This is W map polarization at K A band. And this is the total synchrotron at K band and the total synchrotron. Band. Again, let's just concentrate on these inner parts here. So you see some features are in common, like this big loop one feature. Uh, some features are not in common. So loop one, as I said, is a supernova remnant. It's very nearby, blew up in our face, it, it covers a large uh, area of the sky, and the emission coming from it is highly polarized. This one you see a disk, and the total intensity you see a disk, and the total polarization you don't see a disk. So there's some line of sight depolarization that's happening. It's not due to Faraday rotation because the frequency is too high, but it's likely due to turbulence in the magnetic field, producing synchrotron with, with many different uh, polarization angles, added up to give you uh, essentially no polarization from the disk. And then this is Ka band. So something like that could be happening within the bubbles itself. So you could, uh, you, your polarization signal could essentially be destroyed because the field is so turbulent that when you integrate through it, you don't, you don't have a coherent polarization vector. Uh, and in fact, the simplest argument, in fact, unfortunately, the argument that was used that this did not exist at all in the data period was that if you just take polarization in one band, scale by a single power law, you can't really see it here, but a single power law in another band, subtract the two, you get something that's essentially uh, equivalent to noise, thereby implying that all polarized emission has roughly the same spectrum, and so there's no need for a harder Higgs component. Though I point out here that uh, if you do the exact same thing with total intensity, you get essentially the same answer, despite the fact that we know that there is a component with a harder spectrum. And so the data is just too noisy right now. So hopefully, uh, with future polarization data, we can we can plonk. We shall see how that goes. Uh, we can say something about the relative amplitudes of the turbulent versus ordered field given either detection or non-detection polarization. Plonk will have uh, some other important things to say about the emission, uh, which I want to mention right now. In fact, I will just leave it at that, since I'm just about it. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Are there um, some further questions? Okay. 
we actually know of this attack at the Galactic Center? That is a very interesting question. So, if I was to go to this picture, and say, okay, as I go down here, this is centered on the Galactic Center within about a degree, it seems. Okay. The PSF is a experiment of two degrees, but this sort of rough things, if, if you sort of trace these things in, they're about centered on the Galactic Center within about two degrees. There's an interesting wrinkle, however, where if you go here and look at high latitudes, this is actually at about minus three to five degrees in L. So it's shifted over this one a little bit. And you can kind of see in the picture, it looks a little bit like it's going like that. Okay? That is something I've puzzled over quite a bit. In the AGN scenario, that's kind of hard to explain. In the dark matter scenario, I would say that's actually easier to explain. So there's no reason that the Milky Way center has to be in the center of the dark matter. Uh, in the AGN scenario, why this is shifted by a few hundred parsecs? Uh, the suggestion has come up that uh, you know, essentially the gap galaxy is moving within the local group. And so perhaps the RAM pressure, well, it essentially requires that the galaxy is moving with respect to another medium that's providing pressure, which could be the intergalactic medium of the local group. I think it's going in the correct direction. It does go in the correct direction. <laughs> we're, moving, we're moving in this direction, I think. Uh, and so it does go in the right way, but it still, in my opinion, it still remains to be seen uh, whether or not the ground pressure is actually sufficient to make something that goes up like this turn into this. Yeah, just like the oxygen. So one thing we have done that uh, we are going to do soon, hopefully, is uh, try to answer the question, why is it so straight up and down? Right? Jets are not always aligned perpendicularly to the disk. Right? A lot of times you see jets coming off of an angle. Uh, and so why is this so perpendicular top to bottom? Um, the question is, is if you eject, say, well, in this direction, will it eventually fill something that looks more top to bottom symmetric? Uh, that still remains to be seen. I'm not sure. What's the energy that the T mu particles, the energy mu particles, if you say, assume um, Michael Bell's kind of ideal for the emission of his own energy? I can say that the spectrum needed to make this inverse Compton emission is the same as the spectrum to make the synchrotron emission, which is flat in E squared in local. Uh, what do you mean? So here, yeah, in the emitting volume. So the spectrum does not change very much over the shape looks exactly more or less exactly the same from the end to the end. And the same is true. Right? Yes, but locally within the gamma ray band, it's e to minus two. Mm -hmm. And in the microwave, it's e to minus two. But uh, 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 the two. Yes. So the, if you have a, um, what's the way to say? For our order of few micro gauss magnetic field, and our best guess as to the interstellar radiation field, the normalizations are match up. So you don't have to do a lot of fiddling with the magnetic field, right? Well, what can we use sort of radiation field? Yeah. That's actually, wait, the target photons are the CMD or the marine cell radiation? So up here, they're almost exclusively the CMD. Yes. It's 10 kiloparsecs, and but back past here, they're almost exclusively. But actually closer to the... Closer to the plane, you get more starlight photons in the infrared. That actually is really important. Yeah. I don't have a plot of that, but yes. So what actually do we know about uh, the, the winds that have been blown out, not by AGN, but just by the uh, explosive activity within the galaxy, creating the magnetic field loops and all of this stuff up there? I mean, that 
that's obviously a fairly complicated thing. It does not have to be That's right, not at all. Um, so if you, you know, I, I actually don't know how well we know that stuff. So there's, uh, there's evidence. There's actually a fair bit of evidence, I think, in this, uh, in this scenario here. I, I poo-pooed it a little bit, but there does seem to be pretty good evidence that there's a wind towards the center of that. I don't think it will make this feature at all, because of all of the... No, but it can upset the details. But it can upset the details. In particular, for example, um, your asymmetry, which um, looks sort of symmetric with that ice, but you know, also be a lot of randomness associated yeah. with it. These other phenomena, that is to say, that jet is going into something, sure. and that something is in motion. So uh, I, have, I have two. I have two things to say about that. First of all, there we know that it's complicated because if you look at X-ray maps, you can see some evidence for this one. You can see stuff happening off the plane. Um, that's one thing to say. The second thing to say is is that this is not the morphology. What you're getting at is that the morphology in low latitudes is could be very is very difficult to determine. Right? You see that right here. These two ways of subtracting foregrounds are ready to give you different morphologies. Right? To that, I would answer uh, that the future is uh, is here actually. As you go up, because this has such a hard spectrum, harder than everywhere else in the galaxy. Right? Um, as you go up in energy, the galaxy will start to fade away with respect to the, the Hades bubble solution. Okay? So you'll start to be able to see lower in latitude without having to subtract as much galaxy. So the effects of doing the galactic subtraction will become less important at high energies. And you should see whether or not the thing really does go in or comes down with this, how offset it is. Do you get any hit out of, let's say, Herschel? Uh, Herschel is... Herschel is tough. I mean, this structure seems to be hidden at all other wavelengths except microwaves and gamma rays. The electrons are doing all of the action there. Well, um, then the uh, uh, other, um, higher, higher resolution target point. Mm. What does that do to get some idea of the complexity of the uh, I don't know how much I should say. Well, no, I, there's one can uh, think of blue book conjecture to what sure. Planck can do. Sure, Planck will, Planck will give you uh, an unprecedented look at the integrated line of sight ISM, which will help for sure. Um, it's certainly going to give you more information than we presently have which is the SFD map, which is what goes into just about everybody's estimate of what the pi zero position is. Uh, good. Um, Planck LFI. So one of the main, one of the things that Planck will, will really be good at is by getting such good information on the on the dust at high frequencies, you could do a much better job of cleaning the CMD with Planck and kind of building that. It turns out that in the very first slide of the talk I subtracted the CMB, that process puts a bias on your spectrum uh, that Planck will eliminate, but is there presently with dummy map. The reason is the following. You have five frequencies with dummy map, uh, which were chosen because they represent the value, right? Everything I talked about in low frequencies was coming down. The dust was going this way. Everything was kind of reaching a minimum right around Planck frequencies. Beautiful. Uh, the problem is, is that there's like there's four different ways of making microwaves here, and they will yell at me, but more or less one way of making microwaves at the higher uh, frequencies. So you have to deal with all of these tangled of things in here, and you can only make maps from the CMB based on what you have. So you combine those different maps and ways to get rid of the emission, but in the end, your CMB map is never completely clean. In fact, we'll have the haze in it at some level. And it turns out that when you subtract that off from the data, that bias becomes dominant at high frequency and bias in your inferred spectrum. Planck will make a much cleaner CMD map just using HFI alone, 
you can make a CMD map that doesn't contain the Hayes machine. And so it contains no bias. Right? Uh, so that would be Bob's real contribution to this. And that actually is the best determiner of the electron spectrum. Because the gamma rays are too noisy at the moment. The microwaves is the way to go. Well, I was just wondering if you have an estimate of how much energy you need to put in cosmically to sustain it. You know the cooling time you have this hard spectrum. Is, it, is that an interesting energy? Or? To sustain for how long? For maybe or for maybe a year. Yeah, the so the total energy in the jet that we put in, uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a two part answer. So the total energy in the jet that we put in to get the whole thing to go out that far in a mega year. Uh, in cosmic rays is on the order of 10 to the 2, 3, 10 to the 4 Hertz. Okay? Um, if you're accelerating the cosmic rays instead of in the jet, in the shell, uh, then that is highly uncertain. Because if you don't know, if, it's, if they're being accelerated by, uh, um, by magnetic connection or turbulence or something like that in the shell, then it depends how hard you're driving the turbulence which we don't know very well. But in general, I'm going to say 10 to 53 Hertz. The luminosity of the whole thing is on the order of 10 to 36, 10 to 37 Hertz per second. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you.